The Tuesday in Holy Week, based on Luke chapter 22, verse 66 through chapter 23, verse 1. When the day broke, the official assembly of the people, the chief priests and the scribes came together, and they took him off to their council. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. If I tell you, he said to them, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God's power. So you are the Son of God, are you? They said. You say that I am, he said to them. Why do we need any more witnesses, they said. We've heard it ourselves from his own mouth. The whole crowd of them got up and took Jesus to Pilate. Hide in the corner as the assembly meets, and if you dare, watch and listen to the most extraordinary exchange. They are meeting, let's remind ourselves, because over the course of the previous few days, and before that over the previous year or two, Jesus had been doing and saying things that were, frankly, outrageous in terms of the world views and hopes of those in power in Jerusalem. All of that had come to a head when he had come into the city on a donkey and had challenged their power base by going to the temple and throwing out the traitors. The best explanation for that is that, like Jeremiah or one of the other old prophets, Jesus was acting out a powerful symbol, which he had then explained to his followers. The temple was under God's judgment. All its meaning in history, particularly its significance as the place where God met with his people, was now being drawn to a different place. To a person. But there's only one person other than the high priest who has rights over the temple. As you hide in the corner and watch the scene, you realize how the connection has been made. It is the king who builds the temple, think of Solomon, or who has the right to declare its future. And the king means the Messiah, the anointed one. And the Messiah, according to the scriptures, will be son of God. That's what Psalm 2 had said. All that to them meant rebellion of the highest order. These connections would be obvious to them, though we have to think through them to catch their full force. But it all adds up to an explosive cocktail of accusations. And Jesus does nothing to deflect them. Indeed, he makes matters worse. He alludes to the famous Old Testament passage in Daniel 7, where one like a son of man is brought to sit at the right hand of God himself. In other words, is given authority under God over the whole world. This is the coming of the kingdom of God. As Jesus said, he wouldn't be drinking with his friends again until God's kingdom came. This is how he believed it had to happen. In the scene in Daniel, four mythological monsters come up out of the sea to attack God's people. The last one is the most arrogant. Then God acts up, snatching up the one like a son of man and vindicating him, setting him in authority. Jesus had hinted darkly several times before and in various ways that all this would come true in his own life story. Now the hour had come. Today, there are many people in the world who face unfair courts with state prosecutors whose sole concern is to catch them out and discredit them. Pray for them and for God's justice to flourish throughout the world. Lord Jesus, you experienced in person torture and death as a prisoner of conscience. You were beaten and flogged and sentenced to an agonizing death, though you had done no wrong. Be now with prisoners of conscience throughout the world. Be with them in their fear and loneliness, in the agony of physical and mental torture, and in the face of execution and death. Stretch out your hands in power to break their chains. Be merciful to the oppressor and torturer and place a new heart within them. Forgive all injustices in our lives and transform us to be instruments of your peace, for by your wounds we are healed.